So um, I, I had this picture of you all coming to church today and, and asking yourself, I wonder who would be foolish enough to be the first person to speak after Steve Schoenwald <laughs> retired. <laughs> so, but, the, you know, the, it's, uh, it's a great honor to bring the word of God to you all. What's next? What's next for River of Life? Um, we haven't really talked about this a lot for two reasons. One is there have been plans underway behind the scenes, but mostly, frankly, we wanted Steve to finish well. We wanted to have him have the opportunity to talk to us as he was leaving the body to move on to the next phase of his life. So we just frankly did not have not emphasized what's next for us. Um, and we're going to talk about that some today, of course. But but I, you know, really just wanted to explain that because I, I had a couple people ask me in the last couple weeks, well, what are we doing? And it's like, well, we'll, we'll get to that. And, and today we're going to get to that. So that's the good news. But I did want to kind of take a minute to, to explain why we haven't been talking about what we're doing next a lot. Um, just that because we wanted Steve to be able to finish well, be able to speak to the church, um, openly about what was on his heart. And I, I've had a lot of people tell me, like, the last two months of Steve's ministry, remarkable. <laughs> Maybe some of his best messages of his, since I've known him. And so that's why. But today we're going to try to clean that up a little bit. But I did want to talk about change in general to get started. You might be surprised to know that in the world of business, there's actually a whole discipline called change management. <laughs> Some of you sort of laugh, but it, it is a big thing. When you've got big changes underway, people have to plan for this. Um, I work for a software company. When they implement our software at a large corporation, it's a big deal. You know, we're typically replacing something. It takes a lot of effort to get people ready for the change and to have them survive it. And I say survive it because some of you have been through those kinds of changes. You think about a reorganization of the corporation or, you know, a divestiture of a company. These are all things that are huge impacts. And there's a business discipline called change management. It's crazy but true. Um, but the, the one thing I wanted to say is they actually tell us a lot about how people respond to change. So when change is afoot, what are people's reactions to it? Biggest response, fear. People don't like change. Who likes change? We'll get to you. <laughs> Most people don't like change, yes? They'd rather have it be predictable. They'd rather kind of go with the flow, have it be... Um, some people get mad about change. It's like, these people are, the, in, our, in my world, these are the most difficult people to deal with because they're going to oppose you. They don't want the change, right? I don't probably wouldn't be fruitful for you to be angry about Steve's departure because it doesn't change anything. Yeah. <laughs> but, but the point is, it is one of the common reactions to change. Some people are apathetic. Yeah, I'll just wait and see what happens, right? And they, they can be hard, too, because they, they're not on board. And there's that small percentage of you who are enthusiastic. You raised your hands. I like change. You know, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> no, seriously, we look for those people when we're doing our work because change agents can be very helpful in a time of change. People that can articulate why this is important, what are we doing, super valuable. But, you know, these are the four big things. The, the other thing that this discipline will tell you, whenever you have change, the key to change is communication and transparency. So I, I just explained why we haven't been talking about this a lot yet, because we wanted Steve to finish well. But we're going to be talking about it more now as we go forward, and you'll, we'll be, try to be as transparent as we can, and we'll keep you as informed as you like to be. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm good. Talk to me when we're ready to have a candidate. We'll, we'll get to the process here in a moment. But, but nevertheless, um, just wanted to kind of talk now about what our plans are for an interim and what our plans are for a, a new senior pastor. Good? But change, it's afoot. And I'm hearing a little like an echo. Are you hearing that too? 
No? Oh, okay. Okay, so interim pastor will be responsible for preaching for the Sunday morning and Saturday night services. He will also be in the office one day per week for meeting with staff, prayer, counseling as needed. The interim pastor will have no church administration responsibilities. This is the elders and the deacons have worked on this, that this is what we're trying to accomplish with the interim. What, we're, what we hope is to be largely a preaching role for Sunday morning and Saturday night. We want to affirm that our plans are to go forward with a Saturday night service. We know that people value that. It's definitely uh, going to be part of the show as we go forward. Show, that's kind of a crappy term, sorry. Part of our plans going forward. Um, we're looking at two candidates. We, in fact, uh, they were known to us. The elders have reviewed their resumes, and you're going to have an opportunity to see them in the next two Sundays. So Eldon Carlson will be here on December 4th and 5th. He'll do the Saturday night service as well as the Sunday morning service. And Steve Daggett will be here on the 11th and the 12th the following week. Um, they're going to do both services. The elders will interview them as well as um, you know, you'll have an opportunity to see them. The process for interims is not such that we're going to seek a com confirmation from the congregation. That's really, this is a temporary person. So they'll be here for a, a period of time and then move on. And in fact, the interim pastor will be interviewed and selected by the elder board, and the target date for them to start is in January. So um, just so you know, uh, Steve Lamb will be preaching on the 19th. Jim Forrest will be preaching on the 26th. So that covers us off for uh, December and then going forward with January. Um, interim pastors are really common. They're almost always retired pastors who see the, you know, see the value of being able to help a church transition from you know, a long-term senior pastor like us to someone new. Because um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But there, it, the role is well understood on, among pastors, and so I don't, I don't want you to be concerned about it. I'll, the other thing I will say, we're likely to have multiple uh, interim pastors. We had three originally when Steve was, um, was the target. I don't know what the right word would be when, when Steve became the candidate, but we had had three um, interims in that time frame. One was relatively short, another one was sort of medium, and then a third one kind of carried the majority of the duration. But a, a senior pastor, filling a senior pastor could take anywhere from six to 18 months. That's really worth saying. It's, um, it's a long process, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But interim, interim plans, really straightforward. You will have an opportunity to hear them. We wanted to do this. To, and we'll be glad to get feedback from you. It's like, you know, you know, in terms of preaching, it's super important, but that's the role of the interim. Um, kind of as we go forward, what's the senior pastor part of this look like? Uh, we talked a little bit about this last summer. There will be a search committee, and that search committee has already been identified. It's going to be chaired by Jim Forrest. Um, you know, James, Dick, Jerry, Bill, and Chuck are going to be part of this. We have two elders, two deacons, and a couple people from the congregation, people that have been here a long time, people that are relatively new. We're trying to mix it up so that the, the committee has a um, kind of a perspective about uh, what the church is all about. Their role is to identify and screen candidates. Uh, it's a big job because there's a lot. Um, the, there actually has been a reduction in the available people in the last three to five years, the number of people that are training to really be pastors has gone down. And um, so they have kind of a daunting task. Pray for them in all seriousness because uh, of, it's a super important part of the process. They'll also check references and handle initial interviews, both in terms of are you interested in us, because this is a two-way street, as well as um, are we interested in you. This is a big decision in the life of a church, right? One thing I wanted to, if the interim is a quick decision, could be changed easily, be part of the show, senior, a new senior pastor, we hope will be here for 22 years, right? So that's a, that's a very different process. Um, 
A um, couple things. Once they have identified a candidate, they think it's a good fit, they think they should, we should bring them here, they'll bring them here on site. And the candidating process is on site interviews with the board and ministry leaders, the congregational meetings, they will preach. They may even lead a small group just to see what their overall style is and their, their approach to teaching. And then ultimately, there would be a congregational vote for, to call that person. So this is a congregational effort um, led by the search committee to find the right candidate. You know, what can you do now, today? Um, you should pray. I already mentioned that, but this needs to be bathed in prayer. Um, pray for our church. I'll talk about that more in the regular part of this message. But, but most importantly, pray. Super important um, a part of the, in the life of a church, finding a new senior pastor in a church of this size is just about as important as it gets, right? Bad choice, lots of negative outcomes. Good choice, lots of positive outcomes. You think about Steve was here again for 22 years. We took our time. God provided the right person. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, attend the first, uh, monthly prayer meeting, the prayer and popcorn. Was that what this one? Jim likes alliteration, so you're going to you know, be prayer and pancakes at some point, or I don't, I don't know. But the, but the main point of that prayer meeting is twofold. One, to pray, you know, pray for the committee, pray for the church, pray for the new senior pastor. We could start praying for that person now, even though they haven't been identified. True? And um, to disseminate information. And you, at any point in time, you can always talk to the committee members, the elders, what's going on. Well, you can stay as informed as you want to be. But one of the best ways to stay informed is to come to that prayer meeting because we'll share what's going on and ask for specific prayer as we kind of go forward. Hopefully that all makes sense. But we have one overriding principle that I want to share with you, and Jim Forrest says this all the time, super important, right? We want God's man and God's time. We're not interested in the, less, the latest, greatest person or someone we could do quick or whatever, right? This is, a, this is a God process, and we want to understand who they are and are they called to us and are, do we think they're called to us. Really important. Um, and it may take, like I said, maybe it'll be done in six months. That would be a blessing and awesome. I'll say not likely, but God's going to do whatever he's going to do, right? Our, our timing is not the, the main point. Uh, his timing is. Um, I, I encourage you to kind of etch that into your brain that this is what it's about, that it's God's man and God's time. It's not about filling the pulpit. We have interims to help fill the pulpit. We have people around here who can preach. They'll help fill the pulpit. That's not the thing. New senior pastor is the objective. Hopefully all this makes sense. If it doesn't, if you have any questions, refer to bullet three. You know, talk to the committee members, talk to me, talk to Jim or... or, or to, you know, the elder of your choice, uh, if, you know, Jim Kiefer, uh, Roger Shenison, Dick Borner. Sorry, I was kind of like, <laughs> who are the elders again? Um, <laughs> all right, enough on this? I see a bunch of nodding heads, great. So I want to go back to this slide, however, and as we kind of go forward for the balance of our message. Um, these are our natural responses to change. It's possible that we should have a different response to this change as a body. And I want to encourage you that that response ought to be hope, not fear, not anger, not apathy, not enthusiasm. Wow, Steve's gone good. Um, I don't know what that would mean. That would be a little odd. But, our, you know, our hope is not in the perfect strategic plan for this church. It's just not. It's not in finding the perfect senior pastor, although we are going to look for a senior pastor because we didn't have the perfect senior pastor before, right? I think Steve would be quick to, to say, look, you know, I have my flaws, but we're interested in God's man and God's time. None of those things are what, what, what we're interested in. What we believe is God has plans for River of Life Church, and we want to embrace that. And because God has plans for us, we can have hope. We don't need to be afraid of what's next. 
because God's in control of this process. God's in control of this body. God's in control of your life. And we're going to get to that in greater detail here in a moment. But our hope is not in our best laid plans of mice and men, because stupid idea, right? It's not in finding the perfect pastor for this church, whatever that means, but rather to follow God where he leads and to pursue as he leads, that's what matters. So how do I know that there's, you know, God, there's reason to be hopeful? Um, We're going to look at kind of three things today. Um, The first is which God has plans for us. You may be familiar with this passage. It's really famous. I picked picked it on purpose. It's Jeremiah 29, 10 through 13. Definitely follow along in your Bibles if you like. I'll be, this is from the New American Standard Translation, in case you're curious. For this is what the Lord says, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. God has a plan for Israel. Interestingly enough, this promise was given at the beginning of the Babylonian exile. The Babylonian exile was, right, the Babylonians came, they conquered Judah, they carted off the best and brightest to Babylon. You probably know Daniel's story and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All of that happens in Babylon. But at the very beginning of this process, he says, 70 years from now, I'm going to restore you. I have a plan. It isn't for your destruction. By the way, the Babylonian captivity was a result of a promise God had made to them in Deuteronomy. He said, if you, re- you, know, if you pursue false gods and worship false gods, I will bring judgment on you. It'd be, you know, he's vis- basically fulfilling his word when he brings this judgment upon Israel, but more importantly, he communicates that this is not, you know, I'm not destroying you, this is not the end. And by the way, just for what it's worth, God's not done with Israel. Right? Israel's been restored. It's my conviction that Israel has a role to play in the end times. So don't, don't, you know, God is just staying with his people throughout this process. It shows God's heart for his people. That's the main reason I wanted to look at this passage. That even in the midst of discipline for their rebellion against God, he's telling you, telling them, I got this. That and is super encouraging to me personally. The Bible is full of examples, but I wanted to look at this one because it really shows that even in the midst of God's discipline, he was assuring them that he had a plan for them. And this discipline included, that was part of his plan for them, to be fair. The ultimate thing, he declares plans for prosperity, a future, and a hope for those that seek him. You know, this this plan, or this, uh, was fulfilled, and literally, it started 70 years later, Daniel makes the observation and it gets started, but um, uh, it's fulfilled in Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, if you want to read Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll see that this process begins, and the most interesting part about it is the heart part, the people of God had had a heart change, and they now wanted to serve the Lord, and and Israel is restored from complete destruction. Or not Israel. Judah is destroyed from complete destruction. Amazing, right? Um, but God has plans for us. Yes? And that, and that includes all of us. I have the conviction that God is always at work. Yes? He's not waiting around for us to do something. He has a plan, and he's going forward and for, before us with what that plan is going to be. So, but he's also equipped us. So not only do we, does God have a plan, but he's equipped us for that plan. He's given us what we need. So we'll look at this passage from 1 Corinthians. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the, and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, 
but the same God who works all things in all persons, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, he goes on and lists a few examples of those gifts. I'm not going to cover those because that's not really the point. But then he wraps up in verse 11 with, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So God has equipped us for his purpose. So God has a plan for River of Life Church, and he's equipped us as a body by, through spiritual gifts. This is a famous passage on spiritual gifts, super important. Um, this is not a message about spiritual gifts, <laughs> just that they exist and that they are given by God for his purpose. And that's the one thing I would share with you is every believer is given unique gifts for serving the church and others. Amen? Do you believe that? But they also are not the same. So we need one another is the short answer because God has equipped us uniquely as individuals with a different gifts. We, we're dependent on one another. That's the body of Christ. Um, it manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So it's for our common benefit that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been given to you as an individual, not for you, but for the common good. God is behind the gifts and their use. Super important. So I don't get to just use them however the heck I want. Um, God will direct it. He says that right there. He says, who works all things in all persons. The usage of spiritual gifts should be directed by the Lord. I can't say that they always are. Right? But it's something that should be our objective. And then really, God has equipped us all for his purpose. If you are here today, you have a purpose for this church. I believe that. And, and God has a purpose for you in this church, in his broader purpose for River of Life. So it's really worth recognizing that the, the, uh, all of this is dependent on the Lord, however. Um, I don't, I'm, we're not interested in Brian Cole's best thinking, because it's not really very good, just to be blunt. We are interested in what God's going to do in our, mit, our, in our midst and to follow him. And that includes exercising our spiritual gifts as a church. You may not know what they are, not really important. God can reveal them to you over time. I don't, I'm not a big fan of spiritual gifts inventories and all the things that have been commonly done in the past. I think you discover them through using them in the church. You'll know, based on how God uses you in the body, what your spiritual gifts are. In my, uh, all right, it's time for a Steveism. In my humble but accurate opinion, yeah. So, God has plans for us, and he has equipped us, and God has work for us. And we're going to look at a passage, and you're going to say, well, that passage is not about works. In fact, it's exactly not about works, but bear with me for a minute here. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So my salvation is in no way, shape, or form uh, dependent upon me. God did it. He, uh, Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. The Lord drew me to himself that I became a believer. I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and I was saved. It was all his work. Nothing for me that, that I might not boast. It's obviously a famous passage on grace and faith. How we are saved has nothing to do with works. Just how we are saved has nothing to do with works. Our salvation is not by works. But here's the rest of, and God did it all. But here's the thing. If you read 8 and 9, you might be left, well, then we don't have anything to do, do we? Well, you've got to read verse 10, too. What does the verse 10 tell us? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Wow. Would you God prepare beforehand so that we should walk in them? So our, the purpose of our salvation, other than to enter into fellowship with God and to bring him glory, there, there's a whole bunch of purposes then in the salvation of a believer. But one of them is that we would do good works that he's called us to do. Um, God saves us, in part, for good works. Yeah, this passage clearly teaches that, right? Not the only purpose, don't get me wrong, eternity, fellowship with him, 
you know, um, bring him glory. These are all probably tier one purposes, but one of the other things is that God will do with us is he'll put us to work doing, being part of what he's doing. God prepared the good works for you and I before we were born. Do you, you see that? It says, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Whenever I think about this stuff, it just makes my brain hurt. Because think about that for a minute. God knew all that I would do before I was born. That includes my sin as well as the good things that, God would, that I would do with God. It's all known to him. It's all been prepared beforehand. Um, God has brought us all together for his purpose. No one is here today by accident. Think about that for a minute. God brought us together for a purpose, and he's going to be revealing that purpose over the next bit. Um, we need you. We need each other. It's really important to kind of recognize that, right? That God's sovereign over everything. There are no surprises to God. You know, he doesn't say, well, let's look in on River of Life and see how they're doing. That's not how it works at all, guys. Right? He is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over the detail of your life and also how those details interact with my life and everybody else in this body. That's the reason for hope, guys, because it's not dependent upon us. God has, um, has a plan for us. He's equipped us, and he has work for us to do with him. He's really inviting us to join him where he's at work. Does that say amen? Well, or not. Maybe that, doesn't, maybe that doesn't give you encouragement, but it encourages me because it means I don't have to have the plan. I don't have to be specially equipped. We, we are, as a body, are specially equipped to work together towards this end. And we have, we have work to do. We have a place to be, uh, a place to do that work, a place to minister. This is what, we're, we're, you know, really the point. So no one's here by accident. I want you to believe that. Today, you, you were ordained by God to be here. You thought, well, I just got up and took a shower and went to church, dude. <laughs> but, 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 but realize God's sovereign over all that. Right? It's amazing to me. All right, but what's next? So God has a plan for us. He has equipped us for those plans. And it is, you know, he has work for us to do. It's not about our plans. We want to reemphasize this. It's about his plans for us. Right? Not about our plans. We can, we can go out and do this on our own steam. We can go find a new senior pastor and put him in the pulpit and you know, come and preach. And that could happen, but that's not the point. We want to have God's man and God's time, yes. But more importantly, we want to follow him. But God's not only just interested in the what, that he has plans for us and he's equipped us, and, but he's also, also interested in the how. You know, what, how should we go about doing this? And that's this passage, and it's really important. I want this to sink in a little bit today. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you, this is Paul speaking to the Ephesians, by the way, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So let's think about that calling we've just been talking about. We've been saved through grace, not of ourselves. We're called into that relationship with him for a purpose. And we should live that out. We should a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is what we should be like, guys. You know, Paul's reminding us that these, these are the characteristics that should um, be evident in our church. The fact that we would with humility and gentleness and with patience, we bear with one another in love. These are not easy things under our own steam. The Holy Spirit has to do this. This is a work of God in our midst. So, but, but you know, to go on, there's the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, we're all given, as believers, we're all given the Holy Spirit. We share that. It should, it should knit us together it, it needs to be the, uh, it should be our marching orders to follow him as he sees fit and not use our natural inclinations to try to run what's going on around here. 
the, this is my prayer for River of Life Church at this point. When I, when I pray for this process, this is what I pray for. Because it's, it, it, we're at risk. I'll just say that. Whenever there's this kind of change in the water, the chances of us kind of getting on each other's nerves and saying, well, why isn't this going faster than it ought to? Why, you know, what, what are you guys doing? Right? We, we, we could be at risk of grumbling at one another when, in fact, Paul reminds us that we should have unity. We should bear with one another in love. We should have humility and gentleness. I'm hopeful that we'll have that. But I, again, I would invite you to pray, pray with me on this. So as you pray about a new senior pastor, pray for the unity of the body. Pray for our relationships. Because we have an opportunity for, we can flourish in this season of change. There's no reason to suggest that we're now on hold. You with me? It's, it's really an interesting thought because part of, part of the risk is, is that, well, we don't have a senior pastor, so now what? Well, we'll just wait for the next senior pastor and see how that goes. That's not what God has for us. The Lord is leading us now through this season of change, and it's an opportunity for us to serve one another and to serve him as he calls us. Really important. Embrace the change, you know, but embrace it with hope. This is my prayer for you all. And kind of, I do want to return to that idea of hope to kind of wrap it up today. And I got done faster than I thought I would, but um, <laughs> sometimes that happens. Um, the, the main point is th- let's not have fear. Let's not have anger, apathy, um, because those are not things that are born in the Spirit of God. Right? We know that fear is not an attribute. Fear is from the enemy. You can find all kinds of passages about that. Anger, same deal, Right? We should be a people of hope, not because we have a great plan and awesome facility and whatever, right? It's because God has a plan to use us for his purpose. And we see that in Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Not my purpose, not your purpose, not a negotiated purpose, right? You know, we're... We'll, we'll have a vote and settle on it, but rather to follow God where he leads and to make it uh, uh, our priority to raise him up and to his glory. But to love one another, guys, that's at the end of it. What, what glorifies God most is we take care of one another in this season of change. Please let me or any of the elders or deacons know if you're aware someone who's struggling, having a hard time. Um, we want to take care of everybody, but also look around, look your head up and say, well, who, who needs me to be there? Right? Who needs me to be part of that help? Um, because we're all called to it and we're all equipped to it. Yes? Let's pray.